All right. I've got, I've got everyone tonight. Welcome to the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. It's April 27th, 2022, 7.05 p.m. Um, first item on the agenda is comments from the chair. Um, per usual, I'll just kind of give you guys a overview of what the meeting tonight will be like. Um, we have only one hearing. Um, so the Brian Waterman, the 7.30 hearing is gonna be continued because we didn't get the revised materials until the end of the day yesterday. yesterday. Um, and so I'm really trying to draw a line there because I find that these hearings, even if they seem simple, if we don't have the time, if Aaron and I don't have the time to digest them and kind of anticipate what's going on, it, it's hard to keep the meeting efficient and you know, within bounds. So um, we asked him um, to, to request a continuance and he agreed. Um, so that hearing will be continued. Um, the Eversource hearing uh, we're on. So that's our one hearing for tonight. And then if you guys recall, we have the executive session at the end of this meeting. So we'll make at the end of our agenda, we'll make a motion for the executive session and then we'll stop the recording and we'll start a new recording. Um, and that will be closed to the public um, to discuss the zero Tuckerman Lane enforcement. Um, I think that's pretty much what I have. Oh, and as a reminder, we have our special meeting for the bylaws on next Wednesday, the 4th, May 4th, right? Yeah. Um, so keep that, that's gonna be, that's an unusual time. So we're gonna have three meetings in a row here. Um, so please keep that in mind, Aaron and I, I know Leroy and Michelle have done a ton of work um, for that. Uh, and I know we have a lot to cover for that meeting. So Aaron and I are discussing like how, how what the most efficient way to do that is. Um, but it's also really exciting because I think there's been a ton of progress and like filling a bunch of holes that have made our jobs more difficult. So it's exciting. Thank you, Leroy and Michelle and Aaron. Sounds like that's been a ton of time. Um, so that's what I had. Is the primary purpose for that meeting outside input or us next week? So it's a public meeting. Um, That's what I thought. So it's outside input. Yeah, but it's the, you know, it's our chance. You know, all of our discussion yep. of the bylaws really has to be in this public forum. So it's it's really our chance to see where we are and discuss, give feedback and discuss what's gone on in the subcommittee. Um, and as a reminder, all of those meetings are also on YouTube. So anytime Aaron and Leroy and Michelle met to talk about the bylaws, those are also on YouTube. So if people are interested or audio, you know, absorbers, and that's a good way for you to understand this information, um, that's a good place to look before that meeting next week if that's what works best for you. Um, yeah. Can Aaron send us a link? I can send you a link to our channel. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. But that's really exciting. Um, but that's what I have. Those are my updates, I think. I went for a really nice walk at Podic. It looks so good. The trails out there. Folks, I can make time. It was it's a great loop. Um, <laughs> that's that's my update. Dave, do you have anything to report? Sure, yeah, just a couple of quick, quick, quick updates. Um, yeah, just while while you mentioned Podic, we still have to complete. There'll be a new kiosk out there, and we, you know, we got going on the um, the parking area last fall, and that's probably seventy percent complete. We got some cleanup to do out there. You know, um, there's still a lot of wood chip, a big wood chip pile out there, and we're gonna kind of repurpose some of there's um, there's an old uh, donated. Um, some old donated um, um, yeah, materials out there that we need to kind of repurpose and, and, uh, and, and we'll get going on that. So, but uh, yeah. That was great. Oh. What's that? I thought it was great. I thought it was a great yeah. job. Oh, good. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of ticks out there. So uh, be on the lookout. So I'll be with you most of the night. I'm, I'm on a deadline for the town on another project. So I may have my video off and just kind of working, but I will chime in as needed, if needed. Um, a couple of quick updates for the commission. Um, number one, this Saturday, the, the 30th, we do have a townwide community cleanup and some of the sites will be conservation areas. Uh, I think Amethyst Brook is on the list. Lower Mill River, Puffers Pond, Hickory Ridge, 
Um, I, I am going to be at Hickory Ridge with a group. Uh, you can get more information. I don't have all the details, but um, there's information if anybody wants to participate on the town website. So check that out. I think it's from 10 to noon on Saturday. And I think we have over 100 people signed up already. So school groups and UMass groups, college groups, um, you name it. So that's being organized by the town. And there's various um, uh, way, various places where people can meet. I think Mill River Rec is one area, Groff Park is another. So um, it'd be nice to get some winter trash cleaned up. We're, um, we're Aaron and I and Beth Wilson from DPW are keeping an eye on the Fearing Brook um, work down at the Fort River Farm Conservation Area. It's looking really good. Grass is growing, uh, all the plantings are growing. <clears throat> I know that um, there's an Amherst College group that is doing some, they did some pre, uh, they're doing pre and post water quality monitoring down there. And so we'll get, we'll have the benefit of their research. Um, and we want to do some sort of a ribbon cutting or some sort of a acknowledgement of that project. So stay tuned on that. I think what we want to try to do is, is get the community gardens down at Fort River Farm going at the same time and maybe combine those two events. Um, so Stephanie Ciccarello and I and others are working on the community gardens. I think I've mentioned there's a great group from related to help, Healthy Hampshire that is helping down there. If you haven't been down there recently, there's raised beds going in, there's black plastic to kill some of the, the, um, the grass and, and uh, sod that's built up over the last couple of years. We're repairing the, the community farm fencing. We're doing a little uh, work session out there with staff tomorrow afternoon. So um, we'll have more on that in the coming weeks. Our goal is to have the community gardens open, hopefully, or at least available first week in June, you know, Memorial Day or first week in June. So you'll hear more about that and we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can get everything done out there. Just other projects that are moving along the dog park. If you haven't been, you know, this is a, a project that was permitted through the commission uh, CPA funds and um, uh, private funds from the Stanton Foundation, really moving along. This project got bogged down in COVID and 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 supply chain issues, but um, they're really making a lot of progress. Again, this will not likely open until fall, but it'll be complete. We need to let the grass grow, and for all the reasons uh, we we all work hard on, like erosion control and and uh, safeguarding water and streams and, and the pond, uh, the, the kettle pond near the dog park, but they're paving the walkways tomorrow and, um, and parking area. We've got pea stone up there and topsoil going in. So take a look on Belchertown Road. It's pretty exciting to see that project that was permitted through the commission and funded in various ways. Across the street, the landfill project, which was also permitted through the commission, uh, part, you know, and ZBA and other boards and committees, um, they are very close to completing all of the installation of the panels. And so again, we'll probably be having some sort of a ribbon cutting on that project. I think it's just over three megawatts. Stephanie Ciccarello has worked really hard on that, on that project. Um, associated with that is, an, is a fence that is going up around the south landfill near the dog park. That fence will do two things. It will safeguard the habitat there for grasshopper sparrow which was a requirement of the Natural Heritage Program. And it will also safeguard, of course, the cap for the, um, the, the, uh, the South Landfill. So that project is, uh, that fence will be going up, I imagine in a month or so, uh, three to six weeks. So that'll get uh, great protection for the small population of, of uh, state listed grasshopper sparrows that we have had off and on using the landfills, both landfills through the years. Um, what else? Uh, Hickory Solar, uh, Aaron and I were out there. We were kicking off, uh, doing a, a project kickoff with AMP Energy. Uh, we, we had a, a walk and talk with them, kind of a kickoff to the project with all, all departments on deck, DPW, inspection services, planning, um, conservation, et cetera, walking around with their team, talking about their timeline. Uh, we're kind of firming up that timeline. As you can imagine, solar companies are dealing with supply chain issues as well. 
um, labor issues, delivery uh, uh, delays, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we'll have more on that. There's no hard and fast start date on that, but they will be getting going. I just reached out to Natural Heritage today and said we'd like to have some conversations with them about kind of our end of the bargain out there at Hickory Ridge. Um, of course, the company has to work on the mitigation, the 17 plus or minus acres of, of mitigation out there, replanting of the floodplain, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of things kind of kicking off and, and getting going. Um, I think I'll stop there. Any questions? Aaron and I have a kind of a backlog of projects. Once some things are through, through you and through her, um, we've got a, a whole host of other projects and issues we want to bring to your attention having to do with conservation land and trails and signage and you name it. But um, Aaron has put the brakes on me, uh, you know, bringing too many things to her uh, until you get some of these things uh, completed. So that's just a joke. She's working hard as always. I have, I do have a question about yeah. um, do, with the community gardens, was there a sign up for those? Um, I remember there we is, had something you, about all that and you can contact Angela Mills. Um, um, there is something on, on the town website. Angela yeah. Mills and Stephanie Ciccarello are now working on the sign up for that yeah. with Healthy Hampshire representatives. Um, Do you, oh, well, are, I just remember we had a problem with issues with people not signing up. So that's what I was trying to get at. Are, are yeah, people no, signing up for this? Are they going to be? Or, yeah, there'll be, so right now we really have two official community gardens. One is at Amethyst Brook, mm -hmm. and that one is pretty much full. There's 10 or 12 plots there. Um, right. And so we're channeling everybody else to, um, to uh, Fort River Farm. Yeah. This will be, um, what's the terms, kind of sweat equity. I mean, this is not going to be just arrive and, and plant your vegetables, you know, put your peas in the ground or something, you know. <laughs> This is going to be, people are going to have to work these plots. It's going to take yeah. some time to, you know, the raised beds will be one thing, but there'll be also a number of just uh, 10 by 10 and 10 by 20 plots, you know, in the ground. And those are going to take some time to really, you know, improve the soil and, and um, you know, get them going. So, um, and all of those signups are going through um, Angela Mills in the town manager's office. And she, she does work closely with us in conservation. Cool. Um, but we'll be offering a number of those to low and moderate income individuals and families in town, keeping the cost very low to, to uh, access those. And then we're also offering anyone who used to um, have a, 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 a plot at Mill, uh, Mill Lane, we're offering those people a place at Fort River Farm kind of first in line. Cool. So, Dave, we have a member of um, an attendee from the public with a hand raised. Would you be willing, it sounds, if they have a question germane to your update, would you be willing to take a sure, question? Sure, I, I would. Lastly, I just wanted to let you know that I met with DPW and the uh, new sidewalk on Mill Lane, which again, part of the permitting came through you all. The funding came through the CDBG program. Um, that project is getting underway next week. So it's Whoa, really exciting. That's one with the platform looking at the... Yes. Fort River. Okay. Yeah, really exciting to get that project going. Um, I think I can say that it's a local contractor. It'll be Taylor Davis doing the work and um, really excited to get that project going and, and have better access for everyone trying to get to Groff Park safely with their family, strollers, jogging, walking, running, whatever. That's great. So I'm happy to take a quick question if it's something Related yeah, to related to the update. Yeah, Tom Hardy, I see you have your hand up. I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, if you have any questions specifically about Dave's update, um, please go ahead. Hi. Um, uh, sorry to, to drop in. I'm just a senior from UMass, um, and I have to sit in on one of these for uh, for a couple of my my classes. I just had um, a quick question. I see that this meeting's recorded. Is that available later on the town site? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We have a YouTube channel. If you go to the Town of Amherst Conservation Commission webpage, um, and the right right hand bar um, at the bottom, there's a link to the um, YouTube channel. And all okay, of our awesome. meetings are. Awesome. I'm sorry about that. Thanks so much. No problem. 
that's, right. that's it for me. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, okay. All right, thanks for the update, Dave. Um, so let me get the agenda up in front of me. Um, so 720. So the next one we had is land management. And it sounds like we can meet and hear an update from the conservation intern. Is that still on the agenda, Erin? Yes. Yep. I, I put the land management in there just as a catch all in case we okay. have anything to talk about. But um, okay. I'm going to promote Haley um, Kohler Great. to a panelist. Haley um, started as an intern in January um, and has been incredibly helpful <laughs> to me. Um, this is Haley. Haley, this is the commission. Um, and Haley put together a little PowerPoint presentation um, to share with you all. And Haley, I don't know if you want to present that or if you want me to pull it up on my side. I can I can get it up just so you don't have to like um, scroll through things. Let me just share my screen real quick. While you're pulling that up, Haley, I'm just going to announce for the benefit of the other people in the meeting. Um, just or an update that if you're here for the notice of intent by Brian Waterman of Waterman Design Group for Montague Road Solar, um, that this is 285 Sunderland Road, that hearing is going to be continued till next, our next meeting, our next regular meeting, which is on May 11th. Yep. Um, so if you're here for the 285 Sunderland Road um, solar project, that hearing, we will not discuss that hearing tonight. Um, so please keep an eye on our website, check the agenda for the timing of that hearing on May 11th. Um, and we'll try to start the um, RDA for the um, Eversource project as close to 735 as possible. Just wanted to let everyone know quickly. Okay, sorry, Haley, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, let me just get this in the presentation mode. All right, is that showing up for everyone? Perfect. Okay, awesome. So kind of just to go through, um, I've been working with Aaron since January, um, basically trying to digitize the wetland file logs. Um, so kind of to start off to do that, <clears throat> Aaron sent me a bunch of uh, these papers that had wetland file logs from 1980 to 2021. And the task with that was to make it into an Excel, it was like a, a thousand um, point Excel um, and organize them by year. So uh, if you can see here, that's kind of like a little um, snippet of what the Excel looked like and how we were organizing the files. And then basically once we had uh, the Excel ready, um, we went to the archives where there's um, all the wetland files. And there were about 37 boxes um, of all the files. And basically Aaron would go through, pull out the files and I would record the DEP numbers. And if there was a certificate of compliance or completion and um, put that in the Excel as well. And there was also a few files we found that were not already recorded on different papers that we put, I put into the Excel. And basically, as you can see, there's 37 boxes. So it wasn't really um, it was a lot of time to go through all of them. We only ended up getting through 12. So with the next 12 boxes, um, uh, what I did was we went through the boxes and found uh, the first and last NOIs. And then I went back to the Excel and found uh, where those would be and basically color coded them. Um, so that way, if uh, you were looking for this file that had an NOI um, uh, within the range of box 18, you would know because it would be color coded green. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of information regarding kind of organizing the wetland files and everything. And yeah, so thank you guys for listening to that. And thank you, Aaron, for being so helpful the past few months. Yeah, and I just, um, you know, Haley glazed over it really quickly. It was a ton of work. I mean, just to, just the data entry alone, these records went back to 1972. Um, she entered in manual written logs, and that was like in the first couple of weeks that she finished that. So it was like, okay, let's start with project number two. We're going to archive the boxes and um, an incredible amount of work. And just to put it in perspective, 
it's when you when you get a request a public records request it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack because most of the time i get a dep file number and all of the boxes were by town file number and so i didn't know there was nothing to tell me what file number was tied with um what dep file number was tied with the town file number so now we have a system and anytime I get a public records request, it's as simple as me doing a keyword search in that Excel document and I can pinpoint it and all the boxes are numbered. I can find the box, pull the file. And it's like, what took me days to find a file now will be, you know, extremely quick and efficient. So I just wanted to say thank you to Haley. And since she did this all behind the scenes and no one really knew about it or heard about it, I wanted to just make sure that you guys knew that she did this work because it was a huge help to me. So thank you so much, Haley, and I really appreciate it. Nice work, Haley. Haley, I wish Thanks, we guys. knew you were doing this because we could have <laughs> at least like given you pep talks along the way. Um, thank or you cider so donuts. Yeah, or something. <laughs> thank you so, thank you so much for doing this. Um, awesome. Yeah, thank I'm you. I'm sure guys. in the moment. It was um, really in the weeds, but it does mean a lot in terms of making Aaron's job easier and more efficient, um, which literally helps everyone in the town of Amherst. So thank you very much. And Haley let us know is, if you need a recommendation or anything from the Amherst. Oh, I've definitely <laughs> been using Aaron for that. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> and Haley is graduating. Um, so since she finished and accomplished so much more than I thought she would, I and we wrapped up, um, I just want to say congrats and awesome work. And we're here. So come visit us and and use us for mentoring and recommendations, as Jen said. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank Best you guys. Of luck. <laughs> All right. Bye, Haley. Have a good night. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. Um, anything else before I have 727? And I think let's oh, I just opened the wrong file. Ah. Um agenda so we have to let should we do you want to talk about anything for three minutes Aaron sure yeah um there's something that I think a couple things or maybe one or two things we could handle um I got a request for a certificate of compliance for 55 lilac lane and I did go out and take photos um the site looks fine I was familiar with the site anyways um so the site the the site is totally stable everything um, is in compliance on the site and so i would recommend that we um, uh, issue a complete certificate of compliance for the site okay we just need a motion commissioners i move to uh move that we issue a complete certificate of compliance for 55 lilac lane second second that's leroy on the motion fletcher on the second Voice vote. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Laura? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. <sighs> Excellent. Um, so the second is um, request for emergency certification for some tree removal, removal of six trees um, at 37 Bay Road. And um, this is related to the failed culvert um, that goes under the driveway at the Kestrel Land Trust. And we've been working behind the scenes on that as well, as far as getting all our ducks in a row to replace that culvert. Um, but in advance of that culvert replacement taking place, um, we do have to have six trees removed um, around the um, driveway area. And so, um, this certification would just approve the removal of those trees for the culvert replacement. Okay. Are you looking for a motion, Erin? Yes, please. Yep. Uh, motion to uh, move to issue an emergency certification for removal of six trees from unfilled culvert at 37 Bay Road. Second. That's Laura on the motion, Andre on the second. Uh, voice <coughs> vote, Leroy. Aye. Laura? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. 
Michelle. Aye. Andre, did I say Andre yet? Aye. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. Thank you. Um, so Jen did touch on this um, about our hearing next Wednesday, and I just wanted to sort of reiterate um, what Jen said. The changes prior to me even getting here, um, the markups on the bylaw re regulations were about 800 edits. And since we've um, initiated the bylaw review committee, we've made a tremendous amount more um, to um, correct errors, um, um, all sorts of changes, improvements, um, clarity. Um, we'll go through as much as we can. We're not going to be the last three months we've spent going through that document with a fine tooth comb. So when it comes to the hearing, we're not going to be going through it with a fine tooth comb um, to explain every single change that is made. I'm going to work to set up a page on our um, web, the CONCOM website that has the existing um, regulations, the updated regulations, and then hopefully a document which highlights the changes in the in the document so you can kind of see where the changes were made. And then um, I, what I'd like to do is move through section by section, sort of highlight bulleted points of where things change, and then provide, give the opportunity for commissioner comment and public comment during that review. And I'd like to try to get through the entire document, again, not going through fine tooth comb, but more a broad overview um, of each section and what's changed. That's kind of my, um, my thought process and my um, thought of how we could approach that. So I just wanted to give you a quick update and let you know if you are interested in those fine details, um, that it's all, all those recordings are on our website. Um, and um, I will, if anybody wants a link to it, I can send it to you. Or if you want to go in and check it out yourself, you're welcome to in advance of the hearings. Uh, okay, good. You just answered my first question, which was, can we read it before the meeting? Um, my second question, and this may, this is more to the commissioner, actually to the subcommittee. It occurred to me, our vice, you know, Leroy, you're the vice chair. Um, would you want to or be interested in um, running that meeting uh, just because you know the content of what we'll be talking about really well and can kind of speed us through where we need to speed through and slow down where we need to slow down? Um, you probably don't have to answer that now, but I wanted to throw that out there since you and Michelle have been doing the bulk of this work, um, if that made sense to you or are you at any interest? I'm definitely open to that. <laughs> uh, I'm open to that. Uh, I believe we have a bylaw meeting on Friday. So do you want to talk about that then, Aaron and Michelle? Is that time sure. Here? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. And I don't, I mean, I can be prepared to run it or just let me know, um, guys, what you decide. What are the dates following next Wednesday? So the idea would be that we'll spend an hour next Wednesday going through it and then continue it to our first and second meeting um, in May Good. and provide maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour during this, the second and third meetings to go through it, review it, allow commissioner comment, allow public comment. And it'll probably take that long even just to glaze over um, the sections and the changes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so it's 733. So I think we can move to continue the 285 Sunderland Road hearing. Um, would you share that slide, Aaron, just so we can get an accurate motion? Sorry, I had them switched around in the PowerPoint, I guess. Uh, yeah, can we... Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, move that we continue the public hearing for 285 Sunway Road to May 11th, 2022 at 7.40 p.m. Second. Okay, that's Larry in the motion. Larry in the second. Um, voice vote, Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Okay. There we go. All right. I have 734. Do we have a one minute item? 
Yeah. Um, so the town manager is seeking a volunteer to um, s step up to the solar bylaw committee. And um, Leroy did express interest, but we had a couple of commissioners missing at the last meeting. And um, I don't know if the commission wants to talk about that. Yeah, and I think there we had a particular commissioner in mind who works in solar directly. And we yeah. wanted to make sure if that commissioner um, had interest in this, that she especially had an opportunity. We also acknowledge that that commissioner is doing CPA. So um, understand if that's not time you have, but we just didn't want to make a decision without the full commission since it's going to be a pretty high profile and not to mention very, very important bylaw. So. Um, I mean, if Laura wants to do it, I mean, obviously, like, um, I have a ton of experience in solar and, um, have been involved in similar committees, uh, before, um, I don't have a ton of time, <laughs> um, and I think that if I was going to do this, I probably would want to not do the other group. Mm -hmm. which I haven't even done anything for. So if there's been meetings, I've totally missed them. So that's, you know, that's, I'm not sure what the status is there, but, um, you know, yeah. So I think that's my, uh, I think that's my a summary. Of okay, sorry to put you on the head. spot, Laura. Thanks for, okay. sorry to put you on the spot. Thank you for- Oh no, I saw the agenda us. and I was like, huh. Okay, good. Okay. Um, Dave, is it pop? I'm sure you have some input and guidance here. Is it possible for yeah. somebody else so, to take on CPA? Oh, yeah, very much so. So just to answer Laura's question, you have not missed any CPA meeting. Okay, yes. I was, um, it dawned on me. I was like, yeah, no. today, uh, right? they are considering meeting in May, but you haven't missed anything. Um, that committee typically, the, the bulk of their work, the intensity of their work typically happens from the fall, I would say, you know, October through January, early February, mm -hmm. and then they they often don't meet. So that's when proposals come in. You know, they they come up with their goals and objectives kind of for the year. They look at budget spending, what, what they have available, et cetera, et cetera. I think the solar bylaw that that group and, you know, is is, as as Jen mentioned, going to be, you know, it's really a year probably at least a year long commitment. And I think much more intense in terms of the meeting frequency than mm -hmm. CPAC. I could see CPAC meeting once in May and then maybe not until mid fall of 22. Whereas I think the other, the other committee is, you know, getting, getting geared up and getting appointed and, um, you know, moving forward fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty good assessment. I, I, the, the solar piece is going to be very, very loaded. You know, I mean, it's a pretty controversial matter. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, listen, I'm willing to do it, Leroy, if you want to do it. I'm certainly not trying to step on your toes at all. Um, I just, it's, I'd be willing to do it from a perspective of service. So, No, I wanted to make sure the position was filled, but I much prefer you to do it with your experience <laughs> background. That said, I'm happy to take on... Um, CPA, if that, well, yeah. I mean, I mean it? it's open to everybody, of course, but yeah. I'm, I'm uh, much more willing to do that. <laughs> I'm much more familiar with history than so, to be honest. Who else is on the bylaw committee, Dave, right now? Um, there, the appointments are being made now, so I actually don't have them off the top of my head. I know the ECAC, um, Dwayne Brager from the the. ECAC um, is going to be on it, but I don't have a list of names in front of me or in my head on that. But, you know, listening to the conversation, it, it might make good sense here to pivot a little bit. And maybe if Laura is willing to be on that committee and Leroy is willing to be on CPAC, maybe that's a good way to go. Yeah. Um, and the responsibility of the bylaw committee is going to be to draft the bylaws or to make recommendations to draft the bylaws. Um, no, it is going to be to work with Stephanie Ciccarello and um, Christine Brestrup, our planning director, to, to basically carry out the public process to get us to a bylaw 
and incorporate the findings of the solar sighting study. And that solar mm -hmm. sighting study, we're gonna hire a consultant mm -hmm. to work with the group, work with staff to basically look at the entire town and say, where are the best locations um, for solar to happen? Okay. All right. and I, think, I think Aaron can, can forward to you if, if, if it hasn't, if it's not in your packet, the, the charge of that committee. Yeah, so I'm looking at the email from Paul Bockelman um, asking for a nominee, and it says the working group will develop and present a draft, all in capitals, zoning bylaw to the town council on or before May 31, 2023. The working group will be supported by the sustainability coordinator, Stephanie, um, Stephanie and the planning director, Christine, for her um, designee or her designee. The mm -hmm. members of the working group will be asked to dedicate significant time to this work, perhaps meeting as often as uh, twice per month with the research and reading in between meetings. Okay. I think the advantage, you know, that you suggested earlier, Laura, is that you do work in the field and, I know. you know, I mean, you know, you're going to know the, the, the field and, and the subject matter yeah. better okay. than most. Okay, let's do it. And I think uh, I'll do that. Thanks, Laura. This, there's a required bookend, so you need to have the moratorium lifted in a year. So it's only a year at the maximum. So I guess that's good. So I would recommend that we make a motion for both of these items and it could be one motion. Um, okay. So basically we're moving that we nominate Laura as a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group and we're nominating Leroy as the representative from the CONCOM to CPAC, CPAC, CPA, CPA committee. So moved. So we have a motion from Larry, looking for a second. second. Is that Fletcher? Yep. Okay, voice vote. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Laura and Leroy. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really glad to know that you'll be participating in that, Laura. We appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. Um, okay, so I have 742. I think our he one hearing for the night was on 735 on the agenda, so we can open that hearing. Um, so that actually that hearing is a continuance, so I don't have to uh, actually open the RDA, but we can get started. Um, I want to say first that I think there's going to be a lot of interest in this hearing which we always appreciate and we're glad. It looks, we're, right now we have um, nine attendees in the meeting. Um, so we're glad you guys are here if you're here for this hearing. It's a sticky situation because Eversource is being required by the Natural Heritage Program on um, the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program of the state of Massachusetts to do habitat restoration as part of uh, habitat restoration for um, and a threatened plant species in one of their projects. And the proposal is to control some invasive buckthorn species with glyphosate, glypho glyphosate, excuse me, I'll get that, glyphosate, um, which is a herbicide. Um, it's used often, but also very controversial. Um, so we have to figure out, it's, it's tricky because Eversource is being required to do this by the state, but it's jurisdictional for us because it's application of an herbicide in a wetland. Um, and our job is to protect that, that resource in the town. Um, so possible outcomes here, this is an RDA, a negative determination would mean that they don't have to move forward, you know, that we approve the work and they don't have to move forward with any further permitting um, from this point forward positive determination would mean that we're saying, no, you cannot move forward with this work that you're being required to do by the state. Um, and that would probably result in an appeals process to DEP. So um, they're both difficult roads for everything involved. 
I will say that the, the habitat restoration plan that Eversource has submitted as approved by the Natural Heritage Program is one of the most detailed um, and kind of con well confined and well defined plans that I've seen come across the Conservation Commission kind of desk, proverbial desk um, in a long time. So it's very detailed, very specific, and according to Natural Heritage, very necessary in order to control that buckthorn. Um, so I'm just giving all this background to say that we understand that this is a very thorny issue. We want to be able to include as many voices as possible, um, but we're gonna have to limit this hearing to about 20 minutes. What that usually means is that we do kind of, we ask the representative, the applicant to give us an update on the project. We get an update from Aaron on what's happened since our last hearing. And then we accept public comment for about two minutes, as long as it's relevant to our jurisdiction, which is the protection of the well and water resources. Um, so that's my, those are kind of the, the rules of engagement here. Um, and yeah, with that, I should bring in, is it Simon, Aaron? Okay. Yes. Simon, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. Um, and we're actually losing attendees. We now only have seven attendees, but so maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Um, so I see Simon's here. There we Hi, go. Can you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. Um, good evening, Simon Hilt with uh, Eversource Energy here. Um, Jen gave a, a pretty thorough description of the project, uh, but just, just as a, a little bit further summary, uh, as part of our transmission line um, replacement project that's running through the town of Amherst, we are passing through an area of uh, priority habitat as mapped by Natural Heritage, containing some rare plants. Uh, and one of the things that Natural Heritage has asked us to do because we uh, some of the, the timber mats that we're using for access are have been placed on some of the uh, plants out there. So in order to mitigate those impacts there, they've asked us to um, control some of the invasive species that's growing out there, namely the buckthorn. Uh, it's growing in, in some uh, patches you know, that it's extremely dense and it's starting to shade out or has the potential to shade out the, the uh, state listed rare plant. Um, so working with Natural Heritage, they've directed us to, to use um, herbicide to control the species out there over a three year cycle. Um, so as we mentioned uh, on the last call, uh, the majority of the, the larger plants, which uh, get as tall as around, I don't know, 10 or 12 feet or so uh, shrubs, um, in wetlands particularly will be uh, uh, controlled using a cut and dab method or cut and spray method, which is basically the stems are cut uh, and then a, a backpack sprayer at, at you know, low, low volume spray um, carefully applies herbicide directly to the cut stem. Uh, rare plants and non-rare plants alike are shielded uh, using a physical barrier during the spraying. Um, we will restrict spraying um, so that we're not spraying within 10 feet of standing or flowing water. Uh, we will also not be spraying on days where there's uh, high, high winds forecast or uh, precipitation forecast. Um, Aaron and I had a call with um, Natural Heritage representatives um, yesterday actually, and um, they, they provided some, some kind of backup as far as their, their feelings as why uh, the herbicide ap application is necessary and why the methods um, that we've proposed are necessary, are necessary uh, namely more than just the cut and dab um, foliar or potentially basal spring will be necessary. Um, they provided some, some information uh, via email earlier today. Um, and, and part of the reason, as I had mentioned before, um, with that, that some of the other methods are necessary aside from cut and dab. Um, so when we have smaller diameter stems uh, of the invasive shrubs out there, uh, essentially the, the, tr the diameter of the stem can be so small that it doesn't effectively take up um, the, the chemical that's being used, glyphosate in this case, um, that it would actually effectively kill the plant um, using the hormone, uh, additive active hormone that it does use, uh, and potentially could just cause the, the plant to actually sprout out even more. Um, so we, we again, we're, we're not doing this for fun. We're not doing it willy nilly and, and spraying herbicide all over the place. We're doing this to enhance the habitat of a state listed rare plant. Um, and we'll, it will be a very, very delicate and painstaking process. Um, that, that pretty much sums it up. 
and I can I have the figures if you'd like me to share my screen and again show the, the areas where, where we're proposing treatment. Let's see if, um, thanks Simon, that was a great update. Um, thank you. If you just um, stand by on whether we need to look at those, those um, figures, I feel like I have it a pretty good picture in my mind. Um, but if other commissioners wanna look at that when we come to a discussion, we can certainly pull it up. Um, Aaron, do you wanna give us any update? Um, commissioners, you should know in the hearings folder, in the folder for this hearing, um, there's a lot of information about this, including um, letters from Na the Natural Heritage Program folks um, summarizing kind of their response. You know, after our last hearing, we really asked Aaron to go on a fact-finding mission about the trade-offs here. Um, so their take on why they're requiring this herbicide use in the resource area is very, clearly summarized there. And then we also have several letters with more additional facts from residents of Amherst. So I would encourage you to take a look at those um, if you haven't already. Erin, do you wanna give us any further updates? Yeah, I would just echo um, the comments that Simon said with the exception that um, I know one of the discussion items that we had uh, at the last hearing was, whether in year one, we could just, just do the cut and dab method um, and see about the effectiveness of that before moving to year two. Um, they were very concerned about that, stating that they did not think that that was going to be an effective method and that um, the concern is really at this point about losing the endangered threatened species that is in the right of way that is being choked out by this invasive. Um, and the reason that it is so detailed is to try to save the species that is um, growing in the right of way. So they, they didn't support that. And for the same reasons that Simon outlined that there wasn't enough uptake um, of the chemical within the plant to actually knock it back. Um, as far as we had also discussed an alternative chemical to gly glycosate, glycos oh my gosh, glyphosate. I've said it a hundred times. Yeah. Today. Glyphosate. Glyphosate. Yeah. glyphosate. Um, they said that there are alternatives, but that those alternatives are a lot more harmful to human beings than that particular chemical. Um, they said it's the, it's the least damaging to human beings, that particular one. And so that's why that particular chemical is recommended um, and uh, for this purpose. So the call was not a very long call. They were very direct and to the point. Um, and then they did provide the back, uh, the follow-up correspondence. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, and so just to highlight, I mean, we, I really have been turning my gears on this, trying to think of, of some sort of adaptive compromise, but um, that's difficult with this, if with the goal of removing that buckthorn. Um, so, you know, I think this could be the headline of any syllabus of either an ecology class or an environmental policy class. Like it's difficult here because the regulations can't take into account the interconnectivity of the resource and the, the environment that we're trying to protect. Um, so it's a, it's a sticky one. <laughs> um, I guess, commissioners, do you have any specific clarifying questions for Simon or Aaron before we move to public comment? So it's only it's only three years of treatment? Yep. So yep. after three years, they walk away? Uh, it, it's it's been performance-based. So after each year, we're going to be submitting reports to Natural Heritage to let them know how the treatments have, you know, whether they've been successful or not. So, I mean, we, we will need to assess, uh, assess, you know, year by year, but um, that's that's hopefully what it'll, it'll be limited to. Okay. Yeah, yeah Michelle. Um, I did some reading and I'm not necessarily more clear on where I stand on this, but um, and I also asked some uh, conservation practitioners that I work with about the use of glyphosate, which we do use for invasive species management, endangered plant protection. And one thing that came up was the formulation of the glyphosate application. And depending on the formulation, um, the glyphosate application can be safer or not safer for wetlands and more toxic or less toxic for 
wetland species such as amphibians. So I saw in the proposal or the RDA application that um, this was following um, state guidelines, but maybe Simon, just for clarification, you could um, let us know if this is like Roundup or Rodeo, I believe Rodeo is the one that's safer for wetland applications. From what I understand, Rodeo is actually being taken off the market and essentially what, what um, I believe uh, commercial applicators do is is they don't use a, a product that's off the shelf such as Rodeo or Roundup. I think they 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 get um, straight up glyphosate and then they mix that with other agents. One is a surfactant, which I think basically uh, is something that um, you know allows the allows the material to better adhere to um, to the plants and um, basically something probably inert as as far as wa water or something like that to just basically. Um, make it so, you know something that can be applied in liquid form um so i i don't have the exact um level that it would be applied at but again just just stating that the goal here is uh to improve habitat and improve environmental conditions and is being directed by natural heritage again we, we are uh on the hook for protecting the rare plants that are out there and, and certainly don't want to harm the, those or or any other uh, bystander plants. Uh, so it's the surfactants that can actually be more harmful than the glyphosate itself. So I would just have to assume that Natural Heritage has reviewed uh, the formulation that you're using. Or um, well, we could make it a condition that they I wouldn't know what to ask for necessarily. But um, I assume that these are standards used for sensitive resource areas and spraying. So maybe a condition, um, Laura, I see you. A condition, um, if we were to issue a negative RDA, would be review the formulation, including the specifically the surfactant, um, to make sure it is the on the spectrum. It is the one that is the, the safest to use in wetlands. I also saw a lot of research about kind of the impacts of soil moisture on the effectiveness of this. And it was difficult to discern like <laughs> exactly. Michelle, do you have like a specific product? Because we, we could just state well, the yeah, well, so there's what, so many surfactants out there. So yeah, so I don't have one? the expertise to, to know that. That's why I was suggesting Rodeo, but apparently that's off the shelf. So um, that was what what I was told. So I'm, I mean, I would refer to whatever is con, like approved by natural heritage for use in wetlands. I mean, they, they even use glyphosate for aquatic weeds, but it's a certain formulation of it that's safer than upland or dryland formulations for aquatic um, vertebrates and invertebrates. So I wouldn't be able to review it myself and, you know, chemical composition of it, but I'm sure there's some guidelines um, I don't it was it wasn't in the application it wasn't mentioned by natural heritage but it does seem to be an important component of whether or not it's safe or less safe for um, use in aquatic areas. Well, that's great Michelle yeah I mean I think a condition that natural heritage review that formulation and that we're informed is a good condition Leroy I feel like you had a, a comment or some input a couple of people back. Um, just that those types of things are very hard to condition. I, mm -hmm. I think the closest you could get would be to say something along the lines of, uh, we require the applicator to do it uh, in the safest way possible given the conditions at the time. For instance, even if you had natural heritage review it and come up with a proposed situation, it very well might not be that situation when the spray goes out. I have previously been a licensed pesticide sprayer, and I know I have changed formulations on same properties given different conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will say that is why I'm so nervous about this because I'm not entirely sure there's a great way to make the base chemical use safe. I, I would be totally comfortable for, for, you know, once we speak more with uh, SWCA who's gonna be doing the work, I'm not sure if they have the formula in mind right now or it would be based on site conditions but uh, a condition requiring us to come back to the commission and share with you what is proposed is completely reasonable and and again we're we are here our, our goal is to protect uh not only the rare plants but also wetlands and and the population of amherst so that is absolutely fine 
I mean, I'm still worried that we don't have, you know, the expertise on this commission to review that. So how do we, I mean, can we still have, natural heritage must be using this and approving these you know, around the clock. So, I mean, can we, Erin, can we just have them review the formulation and, and sign off on it and just make sure that we're all on the same page with what is actually gonna be used on the ground? Yeah, I mean, what I would suggest is they have, a um, Eversource has a licensed applicator. She was actually on the call with NHESP earlier um, when we spoke and that we have her provide the formulation to Natural Heritage and that Natural Heritage responds saying they're approving that formulation and then, um, at that point, you know, present that information back to the commission that that process was followed. Can I ask just, just, just what do we do? Remember, we had to do this with Tam Brook on um, by that Garcia's place for the the paving, and they, oh. they treated they treated the buck, uh, not the buckthorn, the um, uh, Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what that process was pretty straightforward. That was a foliar spray. Mm -hmm. Yep, but in a wet, like straight up in a wetland. Um, yeah, we didn't have any issues with that, so the applicator provided just exactly what we were just we were just talking about, right? So, right. Um, I mean, and then and then we just approved uh, cutting plans with herbicide use in buffers areas for that farm. Um, that was pretty straightforward, so we knew the applicator there. So, yeah, there was yeah, also um, on U Drive South. There was a invasive yep, species so, plan. Right. Yeah. Been, there's several projects. There that it, it's like, well, what I'm trying to get at is like, they're all, but they're all similar too. There's only so many ways you can approach these situations and it is the chemical use. So which chemical are you using in that, in this situation? Yeah. I'm, and I'm the just only trying to get, I'm trying to figure out like, what's the difference here than all those other ones. The difference here is that abutters were notified and yeah. those abutters are taking issue with it. And it. we want to demonstrate to those abutters that we are Due diligence. Taking every precaution possible to protect the wetlands. Copy. And I, but I do think to your point, Fletcher, that context helps here, you know, in terms of a detailed, well-confined, well thought out plan with the addition of this condition that, that Michelle has suggested. I think this is one of the better setups for this kind of herbicide application that we have mm -hmm. seen in town in a long time. Um, Leroy, does this, so I am I heard you say that this is very difficult to condition and having kind of done application work before and changing different formulations in different parts of the property. Do you think that this can help us so, uh, address that problem? And my, my follow-up question would be, if approval with natural heritage wouldn't kind of do it, is there any other state authority that would help? Um, and it sounds to me that it would help us given our precedent. Uh, it gives us some standing. Um, yeah, leave it at that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you know, yeah. All right, thanks, Michelle. That is super helpful. Thank you for looking into that. Um, all right, I want to, if it's okay with you guys, I We've had um, a member of the public with her hand raised for quite some time now. So I'm gonna move into public comment and then we can come back um, to any discussion and move towards decision here after that. Sound good? Okay. Um, again, just a reminder that we'd ask people to limit their comments to approximately two minutes and to keep your questions and comments um, to issues jurisdictional to this commission, which is protection of the wetland and, and water resources. Um, so with that, um, and if you raise your hand, I can bring you in and allow you to talk kind of in the order that you raise your hands. So I see Sarah, you have your hand up. I'm gonna allow you to talk. You could just introduce Hi, yourself. thank you. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Hi. Yeah. So um, I just, I've heard you all speak about how you feel pressure from the state and there's, uh, it's a sort of, you feel like you're caught, stuck between a hard place. I just want to urge you to realize, you know, recognize that the Amherst wetlands bylaw is stronger than the state wetlands regulations. Okay. The town of Amherst cares very deeply about our wetlands and it's the conservation commission's obligation to enforce that bylaw and quoting from the bylaw it's the applicant so in this case eversource it's their job to show by a preponderance of the evidence 
that the work proposed will not have an unacceptable, significant, or cumulative effect upon the resource area values protected by this bylaw. That is your job. And I will also point out to you that the EPA itself, although it has not banned glyphosate, the EPA in 2021, their biological evaluation found that glyphosate will negatively affect most of the plants and animals that are protected by the Endangered Species Act. I do not see how that's reconcilable. I do not see how you can uphold the bylaw and also allow glyphosate when the federal government has found that it's so damaging to the resource that you're charged with protecting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, did anyone else have any questions or comments? Jeff Sharp, I'm gonna allow you to talk. I believe we've met you in the past hearing, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was in the last hearing and um, Becca and I sent you a letter that you should have all been uh, exposed to, um, which, which noted a bunch of research and, and um, uh, you know, on the topic and how carcinogenic glyphosate is, how dangerous it is, how it's, it's, it's being uh, outlawed in, in many communities in, in Massachusetts and across the country. And it just, you know, really, is it necessary? Is it really necessary? Have all avenues been looked at to, to, to protect this endangered plant that that uh, you know that we could move forward with, and and I just I question that. Have you have you you know has EverSource really looked into every other possible avenue? My neighbor, um, Chris Riddle, who some of you may know, uh, took care of some invasive species right right where we are, which is right next to the area that's in question, and and he was told that he could not use glyphosate in doing this, and and the name of the person that did the work for him was uh, Joan Dealey, if any of you are familiar with Joan Dealey. So right next to where you're talking about, he was told that that was not allowed on his property to do um, some mitigation of invasive species. So, you know, uh, that, that's it for my comments. I, I, I hope that you look at the research that was submitted to you and, and take this very seriously. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we are definitely taking this very seriously and I appreciate your input as well as the letter. Um, the one thing I do want to, I'm just gonna read. So again, to clarify, Eversource is being required to do this as a condition of their permit with this, the State Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. So this is being reviewed as well by expertise within the state as to how to best protect this rare plant. Um, so a lot of the technical guidance of this is coming from the state on how to best handle the situation. So I want to just put this out there because it's public anyway. Um, this is a follow-up email um, from the Natural Heritage Program employees. Um, and it says, I want to be clear that glossy buckthorn and European buckthorn have long been considered a problem at all three of these sites. It goes through the history, the history of kind of documenting the growth and um, kind of overtaking of the sites by buckthorn. And it says it damages the climbing fern by shading the fern and not allowing sunlight on the ground through its dense, dense growth. Climbing fern will thrive with filtered light, not dense shade. Glossy and European buckthorn are problem invasive species because there are no native New England species that can eat it. Bees will visit it flowers, but many of those will be European honeybees, also not native bees mostly. Its presence is killing native species by shading out native plants that can be eaten by our native wildlife, as well as shading this rare plant. Not only will no person be eating glossy buckthorn, but no animals will be eating it either. Um, and so then it goes into kind of the addressing our questions with both, which both um, are specific questions. One, use of spot treatments, potentially only doing cut and dab the first year, no foliar, and two, use of a different, more effective herbicide, 
which both Simon and Aaron have covered um, earlier in the hearing. So I just wanted to make it clear that, you know, the buckthorn as is means that this rare plant will not be able to grow in this area. Um, and that's why the focus on kind of removal of this, of this dense invasive. Um, so thank you, Jeff, for the research and the, your, your contributions here. We, we very appreci much appreciate it. Um, so, uh, it looks like, Simon, did you also have a response? Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify one thing um, as far as the, the regulation, this local regulations trumping state regulations. I just want to mention that this is uh, under a different set of regulations. This is uh, Massachusetts Endangered Species Act rather than the Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, and another thing that I just wanted to uh, respond to the, the commenter who asked if we had explored all options. And yeah, we really have. I mean, we're doing this at the direction of the state uh, rare plant restoration biologist. Um, one one possible method that was discussed at the last meeting was uh, mechanical removal, i.e. pulling out plants. And uh, I mean, for one thing, some of these thickets of shrubs are so dense that you would essentially be pulling up the entire right of way. Uh, and then the other piece is even pulling up small groups of plants is going to result in so much so soil disturbance that, you know, what moves into those areas is generally more invasive species. So we're, we're trying to do this in a way that is is targeted, is careful, so that we're really just doing what we need to do and, and can then leave the site and, and hope that it, you know, is in a much better place after that. Um, and really just, yeah, that's that's basically what I've said. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, okay, so last call. Any um, members of the public who've joined us um, tonight, if you have any comments or questions relevant to this, this hearing, please raise your hand. We're happy to hear what you have to say and we appreciate you being here. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, Okay, so commissioners, good. Michelle, did you have a comment? I just, I just wanted to like point out another sticky piece of this is that th this ultimately is restoration of a wetland area and glossy buckthorn, I think, I mean, I know some species in that genus are allopathic, meaning that they out, they have like basically a poison that will kill other species around them and they monopolize areas. So it's an invasive species that's already compromising a native wetland habitat. And this does get at um, restoration of native wetlands. So that ultimately is the goal. Um, I'm just bringing that up because it's another consideration in this decision. Thank you. Commissioners, any other comments or questions on this? Um, so where are we? Uh, does anyone have any, need any more information in order to make this decision? Again, this is an RDA, so a negative determination would mean they proceed with their work. Positive determination would mean that they don't, um, which likely results in appeal process with the state. Um, so that's kind of what we have on our plate. Um, we can condition a negative determination. And we've discussed a potential condition there. Um, so again, does anyone need any more information in order to have the information they need to make, to vote on this? Okay. Um, so I think we should make a motion um, and vote. I think that's the best way to move forward. Um, Aaron, can Fletcher and Laura vote? Have you guys reviewed the um, last meeting proceedings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I have to. Okay. okay, great. So if they viewed the, um, the proceedings from the last meeting, then they can. Um, I One recommendation might be to close the public hearing first so that the commission can deliberate um, internally to discuss this. Um, 
just just an option to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think if we had additional information that we needed to deliberate or questions we needed to ask, then we could close the public hearing. But I think that we should, I think I'm gathering that we're ready to vote. Okay. Fair enough. Is that incorrect, anyone? It's looking okay. Okay. All right, so if you would um, pull up the slide, Aaron. So I also added in, um, while you guys were discussing, I added in a condition that the monitoring reports should be shared with the commission regarding the success of the treatment. That's great. Assuming. With the, yeah, with the first condition there, review with commission in advance of application. So that condition, our approval has to be met in order for this to work to proceed. So if we find that this surfactant for, I do not think this is gonna happen, but if it's something where we're not happy with the surfactant and we're, we're do not approve that, then it holds up to work. Is that correct? Correct. Like if natural heritage said, no, this comp, this formulation is not acceptable, then mm -hmm. they would have to come up with another um, formulation. Okay. Okay, is that, are these conditions okay with everyone else? Any other conditions, suggestions? Okay, we're looking for a motion. I'll make the motion. Uh, I motion to issue a negative determination applicability, checking box two and the positive determination of applicability through the bylaw checking box five on the uh, RDA for Eversource. Do you want to just read the conditions? Oh, Our sorry. Conditions? Yeah, of course. And the conditions, uh, we got to be working with the Natural Heritage Orientation Species Program, review the formulation of herbicide treatment, specifically the surfactant, and review the commission in advance of the application. Number two, applicator uses the safest methods available. Number three, monitoring reports must be shared with the commission regardless, regarding success of the treatment, which is the uh, top concern. Second. So that's Fletcher with the motion, Andre with the second. We'll do a voice vote. Andre? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Roy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Larry? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm also an aye. All right, Simon, thank you for being here. We look forward to hearing how it goes. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. And I'll be back in touch with you guys uh, with the, with the, uh, the, what we're gonna be applying out there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so that is the end of the, oh, wait, let me double check that. Aaron, was there more? Um, I, think, I think we handled all of the other business items. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the end of our regular public meeting for tonight. And now we're going to open an executive session to discuss the Zero Tuck and Run Road um, enforcement order. Uh, the reason that this is going into executive session is so that um, we can um, make sure we don't have a detrimental effect on the town's litigating position um, until the litigating about this enforcement order, should it happen, is over. Um, once it's over, this does then become public, just to make that clear. Um, so with that, I think I need a motion to close the um, Amherst Conservation Commission meeting on this date. Then we need to vote on that. So a motion to adjourn, and then I will make a motion to open the executive session. Okay, I will make a motion to adjourn the Amherst Conservation Committee meeting on April 27th, 8, 19 p.m. Second. All right, a second from Leroy. Motion by Laura, second from Leroy. Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. 
Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Okay. So that meeting is adjourned. Um, and now, so I need someone to make a motion to enter the executive session. I move that we enter into an executive session on April 27th at 8.20 p.m. Can you read the full slide, Leroy? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even see it up here. Okay. I was just making my own up. I move that we enter an executive session pursuant to uh, MGLC 38, section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares that having a discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the town's litigating position, which you have declared. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have Leroy with the motion, Andre in the second. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Oh boy. Uh oh, Dave has his hand up. Dave, was this a procedural? Oh no, his hands down. Continue voting, Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, so Aaron, yeah, so I'm gonna stop the recording for this meeting. <laughs>